And then once you get in relationship with a client, I feel like one of the ways that you can really hold that space for them of coaching and not jump in to be telling them or saying, well, in coaching, we would do this or that is really to lean into that power of silence. And I teach my students what I, I call it the 22nd rule. Hi, Lisa DeHart here and welcome to the coaching studio. Today in the studio is Charity Gent and I am very excited to have her on the show. She is an MCC coach with the International Coaching Federation and I welcome you to the show, Charity. Thank you so much for being here. Really excited yeah. to have you. Thanks for having me. Super fun. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. And I guess one of the things that I'd love to hear is really what precipitated you becoming a coach? I mean, I know you had probably a life before coaching and what was that trajectory like for you? Yeah. Um, so I first learned about coaching in about 2004. I was at a conference and I was sitting next to a woman and we got to chatting and, um, I asked her what she did for, you know, work. And she said, I am a professional coach. And I said, huh, what is that? And she proceeded to tell me. And I said to her, is that something I can get? Can I get, can I be coached? And she said, anybody can be coached who wants to be. And so I thought, oh, this is fantastic. And her name was Freddie Ray. And she was my very first coach that I hired. And I worked with her and had just a really, as most of us do, a great experience. And then went on to, as serendipity has it, I was working for a company at the time who tapped me on the shoulders a couple of years later and said, hey, we're starting this new initiative in every office across the world. The, at the time, they were just a North American company. Now they're global. But at the time, they said, you know, we're starting this thing called coaching. And <laughs> we are interested in what we're wondering if you would be interested um, in creating a training and coaching program at your local level office. And so they had some coaching training that they sent us to and that they provided. It was not ICF directed or 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 accredited. However, it was very good in terms of giving you the basics around what we as coaches know to do in terms of being relational and working through obstacles and overcoming the limiting beliefs and all of that. And I became so interested through the course of working as an internal corporate coach for them then for about four years, I became very interested in just this bigger idea of coaching and this world of coaching and found the ICF and got involved there and decided to go ahead and get credentialed. And that was what 2004, like I said, started and here we are 2022. So 18 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And since then, I've just continued to grow and develop as a coach um, and coach trainer. That's brilliant. And, you know, I'm, I'm always curious, like when you think of this journey, this 18 year journey that you've been on that has led you from like, what is coaching to MCC coach? What have you seen as the challenges along the way, maybe developmental stages that you went through as you developed your acumen? Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's funny. It reminds me of that, um, that staircase analogy of like the unconscious incompetence, the unconscious company, you know, you go through all those stairs, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're consciously incompetent. <laughs> and yes. so and that's kind of how I think of you're always sort of up and down somewhere on that ladder in your learning journey. And there's always something new to learn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, and then you want more. <laughs> Did you want to know more specifically about like what I yeah, have, have kind yeah, of struggled with? Yeah. yeah okay. Gotcha. Hear, gotcha. Kind of a bit more personally what you've struggled with because I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that we're all on that learning journey and that that bouncing back and forth between conscious incompetence and conscious competence before we move into unconscious competence. Like I I see us all somewhere on that. But there is a, a movement towards the developmental stages to becoming unconsciously competent. And, and then how do we add in the next thing, right? So that our coaching is continuing to evolve and we're a better coach today than we were yesterday's. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. So gotcha. for you, I mean, like, was, were there any particular things that really showed up in your own coaching where you were like, oh, this was kind of hard to overcome, but I did it, but it was like, it was the thing that I really had to navigate. 
Yeah, you know, I think the hardest thing for me, and I think I'm finally getting there, but it's still a challenge at times, is what I would call performative coaching or working too hard for the client or feeling like you need to fix or get in there and solve the problem. And, you know, in the beginning, you're so of the mindset because of the society in which we live, you're so of the mindset that you have to be fixing, you have to be solving, you have to be doing something to provide value to your client. And as I've evolved from the ACC to the MCC level, the one thing that has really hit home with me is that my value truly, and this is not just me, I believe this of all coaches, and this is what I train my students at the University of Wisconsin, your value as a coach is really in your ability to hold space and to see and witness, to bear witness to another human being and their experience, whatever that is in the moment. And to acknowledge who they're being in that moment, at least from your vantage point, and then to work with them, like we always say in the good old ICF language, partner with them to yeah. figure out what they need to do to move forward. And I always tell my students too, if if you feel like you're working too hard in any coaching conversation, like it's just like a struggle, like you're, you know, Sisyphean, you know, sort of movement here, that's because you probably are. And the best thing you can do is to just take a breath, take a pause and put a piece of duct tape over your mouth and shut up and <laughs> ask a question and then just hold that space and yeah. let the client do what they need to do. So that for me, I think has been the biggest thing because I'm a people pleaser. I'm the kid in school who wanted to get the A plus and the gold star. And so I'm always getting in there trying to tell, or not tell, but trying to help the client figure it out. And that's yeah. really, you have to let go of that. At the, at the mastery level, I think that is one of the key things. It's that presence of being in the moment, letting go of everything else and just really holding that client with a pure heart. Yeah. And I love the, you know, the Sisyphean pushing that rock up that hill forever. Right. Like, and I do think like in my own journey that, that idea of the value we offer is so is such a crucial element to all our growth as human beings honestly and i i don't know i mean when you think about that capacity to hold space what is the piece that when you're talking to your students or you're talking to one of your clients how do you really sit in that space with them versus explain it to them because I mean and maybe you explain it to them also but I get this question a lot and maybe you get this also you know you see coaches overly explaining what coaching is and the clients kind of glaze over and don't really know what coaching is as a result of being told this is what coaching is I'm not going to tell you what to do da, 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 da. how yeah. do you hold that space and how do you support your clients without having like, how do you do that? I mean, maybe you do tell them something, but I'm but two curious. Two things come to mind. Two things come to mind. One is in the very beginning, when we do our initial sample session or maybe our initial discovery session, that first session before you're really diving into coaching, um, the very first time you meet them and they're interested, I say, hey, rather than tell you, I literally use the words, rather than tell you what coaching is, I'm going to show it to you. You're going to experience it. And I, I will you know, kind of set some broad boundaries and frameworks for them as we all know how to do and then just launch in and let them experience the coaching and I literally were say we'll tell them we're only going to go for maybe 30 40 minutes and at the end um, I'm going to ask you number one how was this experience for you what did you learn um, how do you think maybe you're different from you were from how you were half an hour ago and is this something you want more of and if you do let's talk about how that might work and how that might look between us I also let them know that we may get to the end of that sample coaching session and they've experienced coaching and it's not for them. And that's okay too. I once had a coach say to me, uh, Charity, not everybody is coachable. And uh, I thought, oh, that's, that's a relief because some people that I do sample <laughs> sessions with just aren't down with this. So that was, yeah. that was helpful or that is helpful. That's one way I do it. And then once you get in relationship with a client, I feel like one of the ways that you can really hold that space for them of coaching and not jump in to be telling them or saying, well, in coaching, we would do this or that is really to lean into that power of silence. And I teach my students what I, I call it the 20 second rule, where I literally say, whenever your client stops talking, you say nothing 
for 20 seconds. Literally nothing. You watch. I actually have, I'm pointing over here. You can't see it if you're listening, <laughs> but I'm pointing to the clock on my, my uh, bookshelf and it has a, a third hand, a seconds hand. And I literally will stare at that thing for 20 seconds while I'm listening on the phone um, to my client. And I don't say a word for 20 seconds. And it is so hard in the beginning to do that. But once you get comfortable with it, what emerges in those 20 seconds for the client is oftentimes some of the most profound work they will do in that session or in the, that little space of time. So holding that space for them in, in silence is really helpful. I feel like I should wait 20 seconds to ask <laughs> you this question. <laughs> I like the 20, yeah, 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 yeah. I also like the 20 second rule because it helps like when I, um, not only when they stop talking, but when I ask a question, I will then wait 20 seconds to give them time to think and speak before I will speak again. You know, yeah, so these are both helpful. like such, I think such valuable nuggets of wisdom, which, which I think is it is so difficult to move past that discomfort with silence right and so i think we're just sort of like i need to fill the space i must fill the space and um and that idea of the 20 second rule is just genius honestly as far as like giving the client space before we ask a question or before we start asking our next question or before i think another one is don't explain the question. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. We always talk about it like ask the question and then duct tape yeah. your mouth shut. Literally, like put your hand over your mouth. Uh, that's all. Come on. <laughs> yeah. This question. is your best Short. coaching tool. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Short, pithy, few, those few words as possible. Uh, and that's, I think, just a muscle you have to practice it and have experience with as a coach, because the more you do it, you realize, wow, the less I say, the juicier this thing gets. Yeah. How did you how did you get to the place where you were comfortable with those silences? Because for for you and I, I, I mean, 20 seconds really isn't a very long time from my perspective anymore. But at one point, it was incredibly difficult to I mean, it just, as soon as uh, three or four seconds went by, I was already starting to feel this sort of internal churn that I needed to fill the space. Yeah. And, and, and I guess I have two questions. So here I'm going to stack questions, which, you know, don't do that either. Um, one, what do you think that's about that discomfort that we, we tend to start with around the silence? And then my follow-up question is how did you, teach yourself that muscle memory? Like how, wh what was the way that you took care of yourself so that you could hold the 20 seconds? Yeah. Um, so the reason I think we feel uncomfortable with it, I'll just speak for myself. Like mm -hmm. I just feel like if I'm sitting there with someone else, especially if I'm waiting for them to speak and I sense that maybe they're uncomfortable, even if that's not true, but that's the story I'm making up, then I want to do something to shift that energy. Um, so it's really about my, learn, like you're saying, learning to your own comfortability in those moments. And like I said earlier, I think we're, we live in a society where we are really taught in Western capitalist civilization to see a problem, fix it, move on. There is not much credence given to the pregnant pause to just stop slow it down, give it a minute, let it sink, let it percolate, and then think about it to create a response. And so I think it's just a matter of realizing that, like you said, that's another, that's a muscle we have to learn to build. And so I think the way that I really was, was, what are some of the ways in which I learned to build that muscle? I think more than anything, I learned to build it because one of the things, honestly, I realized in listening to myself on recordings, because I do that a lot. I still do that to this day. And I know that sounds corny and nobody likes to hear their voice on a, on a recording. And it's I horrible. think it's great. But that's what I do to get better. And I tell my students, that's what you need to do is to listen to yourself. And you will notice how 
in doing that, you will hear yourself jumping in when you're like, why didn't I just shut up right there? They clearly were needing some time to think. Oh, and that's the other thing I think. I tell my clients up front in the relationship before we ever get started, there are going to be times when I'm going to ask a question or you're going to say something and we may go 20, 30, 45 seconds with nothing being said. And that's perfectly okay because that is time in which I want you to go inside and process. And I am happy to just sit here and it's my job. I'm trained as a professional to sit here and hold that space for you because it is so rare that we take time as individuals to stop and just spend a minute thinking about a question someone just asked us asked mm -hmm. us without responding or coming back with a retort or figuring out what to do next. We just get to be with the question and see what's arising. You know, I I love that you're bringing this up because I, I do think that it's one of the places where it's, it's that holding the space that you were talking about earlier, right? Where we have the opportunity to do more than just solve a problem. We have an opportunity to really explore what's even driving the underlying story behind the problem or beneath the problem. And, and the only the way that we are going to get there is if we go a little bit deeper than let's figure out how to like solve X, right? Yes. Yes. Um, and, I, and I agree with you, too. I mean, I think our culture is so, although I don't even think it's just Western culture, because I see this from other cultures also, we're just designed to want to see a problem, solve the problem, see a problem, solve the problem. And that capacity to sit with that idea that the coach isn't responsible for solving the problem. And if you feel like you're working too hard, you probably are like these uh -huh. are jewels and gems that you're sharing. But the other thing that you said that I think is really crucial is that you listen to your own work on a regular basis. Yes, absolutely. That's that is honestly the one way I fa have found that I get better. I mean, yes, I do a lot of reading and yes, I'm always interested in watching other coaches demonstrate their work so I can get ideas on things I could do differently or better. But honest to God, the way I get better is you listen to yourself. You listen yeah. to yourself. And that's a hard one too. I mean, that's a muscle we have to practice also because I have lots of uh, participants in like when I mentor coaching group and they'll be like, I hate listening to my voice. And it's, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's awful. no one likes it. <laughs> See, like that's I what I it. sound like when I say that. Oh. <laughs> yes. Why wasn't I quiet there? <laughs> Where yeah, exactly. was my hand? Oh. <laughs> Hindsight is twenty twenty. This is what I always tell my mentoring clients and students. I'm like, listen, I'm going to go in here and listen to your recording, and I am just going to give you all kinds of feedback. And remember, it is so much easier for me sitting in this seat listening to it than it is for you, as the person reviewing your own work, to hear it. So uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and that brings up a really, another really interesting question is like, how do we build the muscle so that we can hear feedback from the, the perspective of usefulness versus feedback as you're a terrible coach? Because there, I don't know, I see the spectrum of usefulness in questions and then some questions, and I don't know if you find this to be true also, but in its simplicity, in its conciseness, it actually meets more of the competencies than the ones that are can really you say that again. What are you saying? I'm sorry, Miss. I don't. Know. When you when you have a very simple question, right, and uh -huh. you just ask a simple question like, "What just showed up for you in that silence?" Yeah, that you actually meet more of the competencies than you yeah. do if you hit like like this really long tangled kind of question. And so, how how is it that you see people getting comfortable? with getting feedback or how have, how have you worked with your students to make sure that they realize the, I don't know, the safety that is inherent in the space that allows for this feedback and the part of the journey that that is? Yes. Yes. So what, first of all, I always tell them that in the getting the feedback, that is where you bloom. That is where your practice blooms. And so I really kind of frame it up that way, that this is not about punitive sort of uh, feedback. This is this is developmental feedback. So we're going to fertilize you here in this space. It's really <laughs> going to make you open. It's going to open you up, right? Yeah. And make you bloom. And I also, um, I also tell my students and my mentoring clients, you know, 
I remember when I was working on my MCC and I was going through mentoring for the MCC and the very first session we had to coach in a fishbowl, um, meaning, you know, there were other people present in the room and we had to coach another person in the room and then everybody gave feedback. And then at the end, the, the leader gave her feedback, both orally and in writing. And I remember I thought I had just nailed it. I was like, yes, I am a great coach. And I get this feedback back and it's like, five dash six so think about the icf's rating scale of one to ten and she's giving me a five dash six on that on that session which is like pc beginning pcc territory and i was like what i mean i was floored and i was devastated and i was like oh my god i might as well crawl in a hole because clearly i am not mcc material and what i realized was that bringing some humility to it is a great part of feedback yeah. Of being able to receive feedback, knowing that, wow, it, it's hard to to get it. So as the person giving feedback, I always try to remember, like, it's hard to hear feedback about your, your work. So I try to tell my students, this is a very developmental thing. I know it can be hard. I feel you. I get it. And I want you to try really hard to divorce your, your personal feelings from what you're seeing on this paper or from me. And this is really just about tweaking around the edges, fine tuning the TV. Like you're going to be a great coach, believe in yourself, but just know we've got some work to do. And that's really all we're trying to do is to, mm -hmm. to really, yeah, I'm bloom, I guess is really the word that, that comes to my mind. I'm visualizing pouring miracle grow on students. <laughs> There's the metaphor again. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think, um, I think that it speaks to another sort of maybe a misunderstanding about, about coaching just being like, oh, I've always done it my whole entire life. I'm a natural born coach. And the reality of the skill set involved, you teach at a university. What do you see as that, that, learning and development that people maybe unlearning that people yeah. need to pay attention to when they des decide hey I'm going to really do this coaching thing yeah so much unlearning goes on so many people come into the program saying I already coach I'm just here because I want to get a credential to to formalize what I already do and then nine months later on the other side of the program they're like wow I didn't know what I didn't know and mm -hmm. um there's a lot of that that we see. In fact, I think that's probably honestly most people's experience. I know that was my experience when I went through coaching school. Um, and so there is a lot of that unlearning for sure that goes on. Yeah. Um, what else did I just tell you? Totally lost my train of thought. Oh, well, it'll come back to me in a minute. But yeah, I think that that's something people really have to focus in on is just to kind of, and we tell them that let's have a beginner's mind. We know you all, all have your experience here, but really let's keep a beginner's mind, really stay open and curious to what you're learning and be open to a different way of thinking about what coaching is and how to do it. Oh, I know what I was going to tell you. And that there are these, you know, coaching is a very, I, I always frame it up like this too, for my students, coaching is a very sub evaluating coaching is a very subjective exercise. Mm -hmm. And so what you can have two coaches in a room evaluating another coach's session and what they will give different marks for different things. It's just human. What the, what the ICF competencies and the PCC markers are trying to do and soon the ACC bars as they're being published later this year, what they're trying to do is to put some kind of objective measure on what is inherently a subjective process so that people can actually sit back and say, okay, if these are the things, if this is what makes for a masterful coach, and I put that in air quotes, that I need to do these, 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 these things, then it would be very helpful for me if when I'm given feedback, someone could actually point to those behaviors and say, here's where you did this and what you should have done was that. Mm -hmm. Then I, I can internalize and try to change and work on. It's, oh gosh, I don't know about when you got your, your original um, credential, Lisa, but when I did, it was, there were no markers. There were, there, I don't know if we had competencies, frankly. I remember <laughs> there, was, there was a list of things that uh, CTI, I went through CTI, the Coaches Training Institute at the time. I think it's coactive something now, but they actually had a list of skills that they wanted us to master. And that was it. Like we got either a check, yes, you did it, or a check, no, you didn't. There was no like, 
when did you do it and how could you have done it differently and what other behavior might have expressed to us that you understand this particular competency or skill. And so that's what all of those PCC markers and those mm -hmm. uh, ICF competencies are meant to do is to provide a, as much objectivity as possible in that otherwise subjective process. You know, you're you're bringing up something that makes me kind of think back to when I first started um, my first coach training, which was in 2007, 2008. And I, I have to be honest, I think I'm having an epiphany right now, which was I thought that I just didn't remember the markers that I was trained, but I have a sense that I wasn't trained with the markers because the competencies are very there are a few of the competencies when you look at the older 20 you know the the older competencies that they had out that are kind of behaviorally oriented but some of them are very vague and esoteric like what does that even mean and so i when i came back into coaching because i you know had to go through my own developmental bias about what coaching was and what I did and all of that stuff. So I came back into coaching in 2014 and there were markers, but the school that I went to didn't teach the markers, which I think is a, honestly, it does, I don't think that it's fair because I think in many ways, what the markers do is they give you the developmental or the behavioral indicators of the competencies and the behavioral indications are so much easier to recognize versus yes. like something sort of esoteric, like partners with client, like, okay. Yes. Um, but asking the client about their experience, asking the client where to go next, like these things are pretty specific versus mm -hmm. partners, right? Like right. those are, and, and so I love that you're bringing this up because I think that the markers or the bars, whether it's for ACC, I know the MCC bars are going to be coming out also. Um, and I think that we need to understand what the behavioral indicators are, because to your point, it's incredibly subjective when you have people assessing these things, mm -hmm. which is why ICF teaches us the markers, right? Right. right. And it's even, it gets even more tricky when you start thinking on a global or international scale, because what behaviors are acceptable in, say, American culture or how we express certain things in American culture may not be how you express certain things in Argentinian culture or Chinese culture. So it gets a little tricky, but I think that, you know, this is where this is the best we've got right now. And we're always continuing to evolve it. But really, truly, those like you're saying, those behaviors are tangible things we can point to that say, ah, yes, I can change that or I can address that and and my coaching will blossom as a result, at least my ICF aligned coaching. Right. Well, and I think that's a good point too, which is there's a huge difference in my mind between ICF aligned coaching for an evaluation and maybe how we move in and out of a role in a particular conversation or coaching engagement that we have with somebody. So, because I hear people and it seems sometimes a bit oh, binary, right? Like mm -hmm. consulting yes. or coaching, like they don't yes. cross over. Yeah. I think there's a way of sharing your, what you're noticing or something that you're curious about that also comes from the background of your knowledge with somebody, but leaving it open for them to interpret what's useful out of it. How do you, I mean, cause you still work with clients also beyond yeah. teaching. How do you navigate the different roles that may show up in a coaching conversation? So this is also an evolutionary uh, thing with me and that I used to be of the mindset that, I, and I was trained to say, I'm taking off my coaching hat for a moment and I'm putting on the proverbial, you know, consultant or trainer or whatever hat, expert hat. And let me just tell you or train you for a few minutes on this. Is that okay, client? Okay. <laughs> yes, that's fine. Um, but, but what I have evolved into doing and have learned through my, ge my general journey to mastery is actually to, instead of say that, say, because they will ask you, your clients who have, you've been working with for a while, they trust you. They want to know what you think. They know you know them probably more deeply than most other humans at that moment in their life. So they're really looking to say, honestly, what do you think? I mean, you know me, deeply see me. What do you think? 
And you may have an opinion, but what I have trained myself to do and what my students, I train my students to do is to say, I am more than happy to comment on that. I actually have some ideas for you, but before I give you my idea, I want to hear what you think first. Yes. You, nine times out of 10, it will, you'll never come back around to them asking your opinion. Yes. <laughs> You know what? I, I very much am in alignment with that because I have that exact experience with people all the time. Like, hey, Charity, tell me what you think. I mean, you know this X, Y, Z. And if you allow me, let's first explore what you know and what you think. By the end of it, I often, like, I just see the same thing you're seeing, which is nine times out of 10, the client doesn't even need my two cents. Right, right. Occasionally, you, you, yeah. Say to them after if they do ask me, they're like, all right, now tell me, will you tell me what you think? What I, I have another little trick that I like to, <laughs> to, to try before I get well, launch into saying anything to them about my opinion of what's happening. I will just say to them, well, yes, and I'll tell you, yes, I'll tell you what I think first. And then I ask a question that I use that I, I gather based on what they've just said. Mm -hmm. So I will just start unpeeling their onion before I offer mine, if you will. Um, yeah. Not that anybody wants me to give them an onion, but you know, I like, I literally I know what you mean though. You yeah. know what I mean, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I'll try to, I'll use what they've told me as a launch point, or I'll use what I know of their experience around this particular issue as my, my jumping pad or my diving board into the sea of whatever we're in as a, to, to form a question, basically. That's my bottom line here is question. Always come back with a question. Um, that's just a great default, I think, stance to have as a coach. Reflective statements are certainly have their place and they're helpful. Mm -hmm. And I always think question first, reflective statement second, or maybe make a reflective statement offer and then ask the question. Right. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that also. When you think about your own coaching now, I mean, given that we're all, as you said earlier, on a developmental journey <laughs> up the ladder, yeah. down the up the steps and down the steps and around the steps. And where are you, what are you focused on in your own coaching right now that is where you're really exploring and playing? Yeah. So for me right now, and this, I would just got back from the ICF Midwest conference last week in Milwaukee. Uh, first time we were all able to be together, by the way, since COVID. So that was just in and of itself a treat. The accessibility of non-traditional populations to receive coaching is where I'm headed, number one. I think most of the coaching world, at least in North America, is very white, very privileged um, financially and in other ways. And what I learn when I go to these conferences and the reason I bring up the conference is what I, I get exposed to people who, who challenge my ideas and they say, you know, do you know that over in India, there are a ton of people that get coaching, like they're not your typical client. They're not a business executive from America. You know, these are these are people who maybe run small nonprofits or who are working in uh, community villages to really help improve people's lives day to day. And it just got, gets me thinking like what, coaching in my mind, this is just my opinion only, has become very much a white person sport. When If you have money, you can get coaching. If you have access to resources, you can get coaching. If you come from a traditionally um, marginalized population, coaching isn't something that really enters your world, probably. Mm -hmm. I'm also very attuned to this accessibility idea in that there are a lot of people of color out there who don't want to work with a white coach who don't trust people with white skin for whatever reason, colonial legacies, slavery legacies, all of that. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be reaching out to create the environment for more people who want to become coaches, people of color who want to become coaches to do so. Yeah. And to think about what are the barriers in place? So of course I'm wearing the coaching educators hat more these days than the individual coach hat, but what are the barriers right. in place that keep people from applying to my program? People who otherwise I think would be fantastic coaches, but for X, Y, Z reason, they don't come our way. What mm -hmm. is going on there? And so I think it is incumbent upon us, and this is something I'm working on with my faculty and my team, is to figure out how do we create more of that accessibility? And one of the things we're, that we wanna do this year 
in response to that is to create a white affinity group for lack of a better term, but to bring white people together to start talking about this stuff and mm -hmm. to do their own work so that then they can begin to get inside the the the, the crucible of what of, of all of this and and dig around in there and figure out how do we how do we advance coaching as a paradigm for transformational change for human beings across the planet, not just yeah. in one sector or industry or country. So that's yeah. really where my mind is lately in terms of the edge. Um, and it's been there for a couple of years. And so we've done a lot of work to redesign our curriculum to be centered on cultural humility. And we do a lot of work to try to really force the envelope on some of these questions that make us wiggle. Uh, as coaches that make us very uncomfortable as white people and as people of means and privilege and education. Mm -hmm. um, so I could go on, but. <laughs> well, that's, and, and that's I would actually thinking. wouldn't mind you going on a little bit more about this. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think about that, like a, an affinity, coaching affinity or how, how to help a, a white person, I'm a white person too, how to help mm -hmm. a white person have a, a wider, I guess, a wider perspective, a wider lens for how they look at how other people's experiences are going to have been different than their own and the assumptions that they bring as into their own coaching. How are you yes. exploring that with, with people? So one of the one of the entry points we use in our program, a couple of things, but one of them is we have our students do what the University of Michigan has put out something called the social identity wheel. And mm -hmm. that's where you go through and you identify which parts of your life you most identify with, if you will. And then you talk about what is the impact of that on me as a human, on me as a coach, on me as a coaching client, on my clients, et cetera. Um, we also have people create what we call or write for us, people being our students, write a cultural autobiography, uh, meaning talk to us about who you are, not from what you've done, but who you've become and how you got there. Um, what you know, that, that Oprah Winfrey phrase around the trauma research, which is not, not who, who are you, but what happened to you? So we want to mm -hmm. hear from people culturally, what was your, what was your life like to get you to this point? And then share that with your clients. You create then that space of trust and safety mm -hmm. and a place to begin having these conversations. And what I think is important for white coaches, why, why the, I'm attracted to the affinity group idea is that I think there's a lot of white coaches out there. And this became very clear to me at the conference. There are a lot of white coaches out there who really are have a good heart and they want to do better and they don't know where to start. Yeah. So rather than ask questions, they stay quiet. And so what I'm thinking with these white affinity groups is if we could get people of white skin color in a room where they aren't going to be chastised or berated or made to feel badly because they aren't on their journey where someone else might be in terms of understanding a lot of the, the diversity um, literature and research and understanding it's a place for them to express their ignorance basically in, in a, where they can learn and where we're not putting the burden of understanding yeah. and teaching on the people of color. We are right. doing our work as white people. So those of us white people who maybe are a little further along in the journey can help those who aren't understand maybe yeah. and give you some access points for figuring out how to wrestle with all of this. Well, and a couple of things show up as you say that one of them is mm, nobody's brain works well under judgment. And so, and there's a lot of reasons for white people to be judged harshly. Yeah. Um, so it, so I think having that sort of separation and the point of white people supporting white people to become a bit more self-reflective and self-aware, um, I think is so crucial because there's the, the judgment isn't there the same way since, um, I'm, I too am, I'm not just the president of the company. I'm also a member um, kind of thing, right? Like, yes. uh, you know, I, I am, I'm a white person too. Um, I also find, and I wonder how this uh, flies for you. I do work with people from other cultures and of color. And I just acknowledge very early in our, like that first session, like, look, I mean, it's like the elephant, there's no elephant in the room. I'm white and, yeah. you know, and so how do you want us to be with that? And how, you know, how comfortable do you feel to push back if I say something that doesn't work for you at all? And how, you know, how do we create a safe space for you to go, 
I disagree with you, Alyssa, because I think that's another piece of it, right? Like, I don't know if I need you, if you're strong enough to hear my, like, I don't like your idea or not. I, I just know that on a surface level, if we haven't formed a really strong agreement and that safety and trust based container, I don't know how you're going to respond to me. And and this really goes for any two people, but even more, especially under the context of like, whether it's um, religious differences, ideological differences, cultural differences, color differences, you know, any kind of identity differences, right? Like that, that we're not, that we are challenging ourselves to be more transparent. Yeah. And that's what I, I love what you're saying. And that's why I also love starting with this social identity wheel in that initial session, because it not only sort of opens up space to talk about how do you want me to be with you as a white person or a woman or fill in the blank. It also makes you vulnerable. Yes. A coach, Mm -hmm. because you're suddenly sharing something that could potentially you know, you're putting your belly, your, your soft side is out facing. Yeah. And so that's huge. Like you can't have trust unless you have the the ability to be vulnerable with one another. And so Mm -hmm. you can tell a client, this is something else I've learned in my evolution. You can tell a client all day long that the space is safe, but they really have to experience it first before they're really going to buy into it. It's sort of like, what is coaching, right? Like yes, they really need exactly. to experience it, right? Yes. Not just That's the way you integrate the knowledge. And really, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is so crucial. And I think that, and, and I especially think, and this is a maybe a bias of mine, um, is that if I haven't done that work around my own privilege, and not that I haven't earned everything that I've developed in my life on some level, but the recognition that I got a, I got an, I got a easier row to hoe, right? Like I didn't have all the rocks and stuff in my row that I had to like chip away in order to find myself where I am maybe, or I may have had a ton of rocks in my way. Yeah, they were also. just yours. They yeah, were just my different. rocks. Yeah. And, but that, that other people have had very different experiences than me, like until I'm capable of having that awareness, it's really incredibly different, difficult for me to really appreciate somebody else's experience that is vastly different than my own. Right. Yeah. And this is where I think the powerful questions being the short, the pithy, the not too many words, long and tangled questions become so huge as a skill to master as a coach. Because you're not assigning any interpretation to anything when you say yes. things like, what else? Or how does that feel in your body? Or, you know, fill in the blank. So, right. yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's true because there's no, there's, it doesn't matter what your your identity is, whether it's your, you know, gender, whether it's your culture, what, no matter what it is, what are you noticing is is really neutral. Yes. Right. And it doesn't have an implicit or an explicit judgment attached to it that's negative. It's just an inquiry to you in your space as you, your humanness. What is it that you're experiencing in this moment? What are you learning about yourself? What are you noticing? And I, and I think this is crucial, not just to coaches. Honestly, I think that this is crucial to human beings in general, but I love that you guys are working on this with coaches because coaches really, I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're going into a relationship where there's going to, if, if any real work is going to be done, there has to be vulnerability. And as the person who's asking the questions, the onus is on me to be vulnerable first. Exactly. Right. Because there is some positional power as the person asks, you know, asking the questions versus the person answering the questions. You know, I was a therapist for many years, for about 20 years before I became a coach. Um, I guess I did remember that, but I'd forgotten. Yeah. Well, you know, but my life. um, Yeah. So, um, but that was one of the things, too, that I always struggled with. And I would just say to clients when I met them, look, I'm not the kind of therapist who's going to just sit here and go, hmm, mm hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If I feel like there's something useful to share of myself, I'm also going to share that. And 
And I felt like, because I wanted to kind of bring equality into Mm -hmm. the seats that we were sitting in, that -hmm. it wasn't me in that position of power, but a lot of people, and I think people come to coaches, therapists, doctors, attorneys, like all sorts of different experts, you know, um, people who are consultants putting on that consultant hat have are just as soon as they change that hat, they move themselves into that expertise. Yes. And that means somebody else has moved into the not knowing, right? Like the, yes. the child or the, 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 whatever the not knowing place is, right? Yes. <laughs> um, yes. The, novice, I love the not whatever. knowing. I was just, you're making me think about, I was at a session um, in at the conference and it was called not the power of not knowing. And it was an entire 90 minute breakout around not the, 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 the gifts of not knowing possibility and, and curiosity and intrigue and mystery and like uh, just all of it. And so, yeah, not knowing yeah, that, that, that peer to peer relationship is so key. That partnership of equals is so key. I always like to tell my students that the power, in a coaching relationship, and this isn't mine, this is probably something I learned along the way or could have been in my original training. The power of the relationship doesn't sit with the coach and it honestly doesn't sit with the client. The power sits with the relationship itself. Like we're granting power to this case. Uh, that's where the power lies in this dynamic. And I yeah. think that those things, like you said, that you tell them up front and then they just have to experience it time and time again with you before yeah. they really trust it fully. Yeah. And I think it's also really interesting too. I mean, there are going to be moments where like, it doesn't happen all the time to me, <laughs> thank God. But I mean, there's certainly been times where I've had somebody be like, no, you're not listen- like, you don't understand. And maybe it's just a s- somatic difference or whatever like and I if I can go this isn't personal this is an experience somebody's having how would I if I were this frustrated want to be treated and I go tell me more about this I really want to understand it's a very different response than getting defensive or upset about something and I mean it doesn't happen very much to me anymore like rarely but I'm thinking of a, a conversation that I had with somebody of color where I had, I was trying to understand something, but then I could have gone more with not knowing um, in that moment. And they got really annoyed with me. And I said, oh, well, you know what? Forget that because clearly there's something going on here that I don't understand and it isn't important. How would you like to move forward in a way that is more useful for you in this moment? And then they told me and we had a conversation the next session about it, but my my ability to not get it personal, not take person take it personally, not get angry, not yes. get defensive, like all the different things that are possible in the human experience actually was the thing that created even more trust. Yes. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Keeping that in mind that you are part of us, we're part of a system. And sometimes yeah. as human beings within a system, we're going to respond in certain ways and that it's hard not to take it personally, but that honestly is you have to retrain your brain not to take yeah. it personally and to just yeah. stay curious more than anything. You know, if you see somebody yeah. frustrated with something you've said, or they're like, why aren't you hearing me? You've got to stop yourself, especially as a coach <laughs> and just go, whoa, I am noticing that I just really, something really upset you just there. And what I said, what's yeah. going on? You know, like yeah. really with, with pure heart and, and complete com- empathy and compassion. Yeah. Well, and I think you spoke to it earlier. There's you and there's me, and then there's this relationship between us. And if, if the goal is this relationship between us, yes, then it's, then I'm not, I don't, it doesn't have to be about me or you, it can be about what does this relationship mean? Yes. And right? what are we creating in that space? Yeah. yeah. What's possible what we... in that space? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, fun. Charity, this has just been so much fun talking with you. So I'm glad that you were willing to go further into this because I think it's just crucial. And to your point, there's a, a lot of, you know, white or affluent, because I think socioeconomics is a difference, yes. you know, differentiator also. And, um, and just recognizing that, that it, people have an opportunity to really learn more about themselves and thus show up better with other people as a result Absolutely. of that. Um, I'm going to be putting links to you for LinkedIn and to your website. Um, but 
I have been closing each session with a question, or each session, each podcast with a, apparently I've forgotten where I am, um, with a question. <laughs> and that question is, if you were writing your autobiography today, what would you title it? Oy, um, <laughs> I love the response. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's my, oy. <laughs> <laughs> My autobiography, um, I would say probably um, I, I, the word enthusiastic change is, or those two words are coming up to me, something like that. Change with, I don't know, enthusiastic, oh, we'll go with that, enthusiastic change. Yeah. Brilliant. I love that, <laughs> enthusiastic change. Thank yeah. you so much for being on the coaching studio oh, today. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me and letting me share some time with you. This has been great.